I'm Bob Duhamel, and today I am going to explain why iron increases the inductance of an inductor. Now, what is an inductor? Of course, it's just simply a coil of wire. So I'll draw a coil of wire here, and we'll have, oh, how about an AC power source? And so what we're going to have is a current that goes back and forth that's going to cause a changing magnetic field that builds in one polarity, collapses. I keep saying building and collapsing. That's the typical model used in electronics about magnetic fields. It's a quick explanation. Of course, it's not actually getting bigger and smaller. It's just getting more powerful, less powerful. But I'm going to keep using building collapse because that's what everyone else uses. And it's a good metaphor for how inductors work. So we have that magnetic field builds, collapses, reversals polarity builds and collapses, goes back and forth. And we get a certain amount of inductance because of the electromagnetic interaction between these loops of wire. Each one affects the other one. And basically, when we try to send current this way, it says, oh, no, you're not either. But then as that current stabilizes, the magnetic field stops moving. And so it now lets the current through. But as soon as that current decreases, that magnetic field starts to collapse, which tries to keep the current going. So basically, when we push current into an inductor, it pushes back until the magnetic field stabilizes. And then when we try to stop the current, it tries to keep it going. It works sort of like a flywheel. But I talk much more about that in another video about how inductors work, which I have linked in the description below. But if we put iron inside this, it increases the inductance. Why? Well, I usually say it concentrates the magnetic fields, which is a quick way of saying it when I'm explaining an inductor. But that's not exactly how it works. So let's find out why iron, and not aluminum or copper, but iron, or nickel or cobalt would work too, but iron's cheaper. Why does that increase the inductance of an inductor? Well, let's take a look at the composition of matter first. We have a bunch of atoms. I'm just going to draw a quick grid of atoms here. This could be a metal, it could be any element, but we'll just say it's aluminum or copper or some other kind of non-magnetic metal. And I'm going to say that the electrons are orbiting around in different planes. And although this isn't really what's happening, this is kind of an average of what the energy does. So we could argue, well, electrons really don't orbit around the atom. That's the Rutherford Bohr model, which does explain some things. The Rutherford Bohr model explains some averages, which are perfectly good for almost all explanations about what atoms do. So we'll keep using it. These electrons are orbiting in these different planes. Now those electrons, when they're moving, create magnetic fields. You can watch my video on how electricity creates magnetism, which I have linked below. And these magnetic fields, well, we'll align them, you know, north, south, north, south. So I'm putting the magnetic field perpendicular to the orbit of the electrons. I'll just draw them like that. And they're all random different directions. And so they all tend to cancel each other out. So that's most materials, but iron, nickel, and cobalt, three materials that we call the magnetic materials, if that's the proper name, they work the same except groups of atoms. I'll put a few over here and a few over here, and maybe a few over here. The groups of atoms tend to line up. I'm going to just draw the magnetic poles. These are not the alignment of the electrons. So this is north south. So the electrons will be going perpendicular to this north, south, north, south, south. So notice that these tend to line up and these will line up this group in another direction. I'll just draw the lines here and draw those lines there. And they call these magnetic domains. And so the groups of atoms, uh, I don't really fully understand why they don't all line up, but that's physics. We'll just deal with it. So this group's going to line up this way. That group's going to line up the other way. And so once again, we have the same thing, the magnetic fields are all kind of randomized, so they cancel each other out, but we have these magnetic domains that tend to line up with each other. Now here's the big difference between nickel, cobalt, and iron and other metals. If I put a magnetic field across here, these domains will start to line up with that magnetic field. So this one's already lined up with it. And let's turn these around and those are going to tend to line up with it. It depends on the strength of the magnetic field. I think it's a quantum effect. And so some of the domains will line up and some won't. The stronger the magnetic field, the more domains that will line up. So if we 
strengthen that magnetic field, even more of these domains will line up with it. And so that's a property of iron, nickel, and cobalt that other metals don't do. And so what has happened? Now we have these adding to the magnetic field that is causing them to line up. Now, when I remove the magnetic field, they're going to go back to the way they were. So we take away the magnetic field and they all go back to being random again. Some of those domains are not going to go back. They'll stay lined up and uh, it'll mildly magnetize this metal. So if we go back to our piece of metal and we'll just say, okay, non-magnetized piece of iron. If we put it in a magnetic field and take that magnetic field away, some of those domains will remain lined up and we'll end up with a weak magnetic field around this. And unless we have certain uh, alloys such as silicon steel that we call soft iron, uh, loses that property much more. I'm sure it still has some of that property, but much less. So silicon steel, which we call soft iron, will not do this as much as straight iron. But put it in a magnetic field, take it out of the magnetic field, it will retain some of its magnetism, but not much. However, what if we put it in a strong magnetic field and then heat it up? If we heat it past a certain temperature called the Curie temperature, I don't know what they are for particular metals, but heat our iron up to a particular temperature. If we do that outside of a magnetic field, it's just going to randomize all the magnetic domains. So if you take a permanent magnet and heat it up, it's going to become a non-magnet. But if we do that in a strong magnetic field, heat this beyond the Curie temperature, then let it cool, it's going to retain that magnetism that it had while it was in that magnetic field. So that's how we make permanent magnets. Take some iron, put it in a strong magnetic field, heat it up to the Curie temperature, let it cool in the magnetic field, and voila, we have all those domains all lined up in that iron, and we have a permanent magnet. But if we have silicon steel or soft iron, that's not going to work. And that's what we use in electronics to increase inductance. We use the soft iron because we don't want it to retain the magnetism that it has when it's in a magnetic field. But let's look at what happens. Let's take that coil again. Don't really need that to explain this, but we'll put it there. Let's just make this a DC field for right now. I'm going to put a battery here and I'll put a switch here just so we can turn it on and off. So let's flip that switch. Don't need to know the voltage or the size of the inductor. We're just being general here. I have current going through there. So now I'm going to have a magnetic field around that inductor, which I'll draw the typical way we draw magnetic fields. You know, North is one way, South is the other way. Do I have that right? It depends on which way the current's flowing and which way the coils are wound. And you can't tell by looking. So we'll just say North is that way, South is that way. Now what's going to happen if I drop some iron in here? Okay. What does the iron have? It has a bunch of magnetic domains that are all randomized, but what do iron, nickel, and cobalt do that other metals don't do? Those magnetic domains are going to align with the magnetic field here, and so they're all going to line up, and now that becomes a temporary bar magnet, assuming that it's you know, an iron that's not going to retain its magnetism. So the magnetism of the iron adds to the magnetism of that magnetic field, and the stronger we make that magnetic field, the more domains are going to line up and the stronger the magnetic field in the iron is going to get. So the reason that iron increases the inductance is because the magnetic field of the inductor lines up the magnetic domains in the iron, making the iron magnetic. So now we have an electromagnet and an iron magnet that's been turned on by the electromagnet. Open this up. The magnetic field disappears and then of course, all those domains in the iron all go back to being random, and so the magnetic field is gone. So, by putting the iron into the magnetic field, the iron becomes magnetic. So, we're not really concentrating the magnetic field, we are actually adding to it. And so, we can make a variable inductor by having that... Let me redraw this real quickly. There's our inductor, and we'll take a piece of iron that we can move in and out. And as we move more and more of that iron into the magnetic field, more of it becomes magnetic and more increase of the magnetic field, so it increases the effect of the inductor. So as we put this to an AC source, as those magnetic fields build and collapse, they are 
making the iron get more magnetic, less magnetic. Reverse polarity, more magnetic, less magnetic. And so it actually adds to the magnetic field by putting the iron in there. The more iron, the stronger that magnetic field gets. Now we might actually be using something called ferrite, which is powdered iron mixed with clay, which has two advantages. One, we can make it whatever shape we want to. And for these inductors, we'll often make it screw shape, put some threads on it and put a little Phillips screwdriver in there. We can turn that and turn it in and turn it out and screw it into the coil and screw it out to the coil to make that a, an adjustable uh, inductance. And also ferrite being powdered iron suspended in the clay, we don't get a lot of electrical current inside the iron because if we have a solid piece of iron, uh, oscillating magnetic field is going to cause currents in that iron. We call them eddy currents. We want to reduce those eddy currents because those are going to produce power and they're going to heat up the iron and we're going to lose energy and get heat. If we get rid of those eddy currents by using ferrite, we use less power in the inductor. And of course, uh, this might be a laminated steel or laminated iron that also reduces eddy currents and of course that's what we use in transformers and just a real quick word about transformers of course we wind our coil on an iron core i'm just going to draw it this way there's our iron core we put one coil here we put the other coil over here and of course that magnetic field travels across the iron over to here and couples the other coil with it. Now typically they'll wind one coil on top of the other or wind them next to each other but we could make them on a frame like that. In fact that's exactly what a toroidal transformer is. We have a ring of ferrite and we put one coil over here and another coil over here and we get a transformer and the ferrite transfers the magnetic field from one side to the other. So iron increases the inductance of an inductor because the magnetic field of the inductor causes the iron to become magnetic itself and adds to the magnetic field. So now next time you're adjusting that ferrite core to make your inductor or more inductance or less inductance, you now know why it works. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel and subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible and a big thank you to everyone for watching.